Welcome back to Season 2 of Asian Provocation. I'm really excited to share with you the new content. These are really intense times for the Asians out there right now going through difficulties. I want to say I hear you. Every day we wake up to more violence and anger. At this moment, there's a military coup, an explosion of violence as the security forces fire on peaceful protesters in Myanmar. The anti-Asian hate crimes in the United States are exploding with much more mainstream still watching in silence. Though none of these events are surprising, there's an acceleration for all that we have feared. And the question is how we will deal with these fears. We've been living in a dream. A dream where constructed myths are taken as singular realities. But they're shattering. I'm simultaneously excited by this freedom, as well as the mourning for the loss of so much of the past constructs that we've held onto for so long. We're all questioning and examining so much of our actions. As we start the new season, I also want to take this opportunity to say to you how much this means to me. Your words, your solidarity, your support. To be seen and to be heard. Thank you. On this episode, I have for you Dr. Kotalin Ferber. A dear friend, Yatsin Tolas, told me over dinner about an interesting Hungarian economic historian and social scientist who's been living and teaching in Japan for 17 years. She's returned to live in Berlin since the Fukushima triple disaster. When we spoke over the phone, I was immediately touched by her humanness and her energy. She shared with me her book, Islands of Otherness, which despite our difference in age and background, I could relate immediately to her experiences and points of view. She speaks on the various contradictions and loopholes on the Japanese tertiary education system, her experiences living the everyday life as a foreign woman in Japan. It was apparent for me immediately that this is an important voice to share with you on Asian provocation. So without further ado... So shall we record both of us? Here's my conversation with Dr. Kotlin Ferber. Okay. I'm ready, Ayoto. No problem. From hearing about your story and your life, I already... I was already very curious about you, and especially this book, Islands of Otherness. Oh, yeah. (laughs) I already very much loved our first conversation. The way you approached it and spoke about it, the book resonated with me very much, especially how you closed the book with regards to Japan, that it wasn't really about Japan. It could be about anywhere. No, exactly. Now you got the point. You hit the nail. Indeed, I told because just the background, I have hundreds and thousands of enemies because, quote, I hate Japan. Why you are living in a country which you hate, blah, blah, blah. My answer usually used to be that, you know, no matter whether I had been in the U.S., which, you know, I know quite well because I used to work there, or in Canada, or Australia, or New Zealand, it doesn't matter because my eyes noticing what people do not want to notice. It's my personality. From the first chapter, she opens the book with the following words. From the moment of my birth, I was enveloped by legends as if somebody was shaking an invisible censor over my head. Nobody was telling the truth. I understood after reading a book that we were connected in a way, not through the classification or categorization of race or ethnicity, but by being othered. And as she describes herself, my otherness chased me away from Hungary. Of course, we never can give as human beings one reason for understanding anything. But the number one reason for having this critical mindset, in my case, is my background. I was coming from the absolutely marginalized and absolutely hopeless cohort of my society, Hungary. And the second reason is because, you know, we have thousands of varieties, how these marginalized background, childhood and more just turns the personality to the opposite, accepting everything, being loyal to everything because of the fear. But uh, actually, I had one privilege comparing to the others in this marginalized situation, 
which lasted at least 35 years in my life, the first 35 years. Sorry for saying that. It's not a self-praising, but since childhood, I was a very smart creature. So my smartness saved me. And it saved, you know, the critical thinking and critical viewing. So no matter where I was, and I used to work in several countries, Japan was the last one, so to speak. I'd been seeing the invisible. I'd been searching what no one wanted to search because understanding uh, the sources of suffering and the sources of pain for the human being, I do believe it's easing the pain, at least in my case. So when I understood the clear, absolutely crystal clearly formulated discrimination in Japan against uh, not only foreigners, but against hidden minorities, outcasts, Then I understood it because I learned the background, I learned the history. Somehow, because I understood it, the pain was less. Was it painful the first 35 years? Now, the first 20 years, uh, being very precise, was unbearable because uh, my parents uh, were coming from two extreme backgrounds. One was coming from a Catholic monastery as a nun, but the Communist Party dissolved all of the religious institutes. So she spent my mother there 17 years. My goodness, 17 years. From Tuesday to Wednesday, the Communist Party declared that her monastery couldn't exist anymore. And she was standing there knowing nothing about the normal everyday life. And my father was coming from outside of the country, but used to belong to Hungary, the upper part, the northern part, nowadays Slovakia, uh, from a Jewish community. And my great grandfather used to be a rabbi. So, you know, these two extreme parents under the Stalinist period were very successful people because they had a lot to hide. So they were performing the maximum loyalty toward the communist regime. Therefore, they got a lot of privilege, but they didn't want to have a child, but the abortion was strictly prohibited and threatened by 10 years imprisonment for any medical doctor. So I was born as a not exactly wanted child, putting mildly. But my mother became a very severe alcoholic while she was pregnant. And my father left my mother and first uh, working in countryside. And then in 1956, the Hungarian borders were open. He fled and ending up in the United States like the other 200,000 Hungarians who left in 56 when the Soviet tanks came. So I grew up in a hospital with a fake name because that's how my mother wanted to get rid of me, being alone. I grew up by my grandparents for a time being. I grew up in uh, unknown acquaintances, not even relatives. And practically my childhood was nothing else but witnessing my mother alcoholic habit. And uh, my father was in the United States. Actually, they never divorced legally because at that time between the US and Hungary never had an international legal agreement. After my father in 1962, My Jewish grandma and my Jewish uncle, my father, far younger brother, also fled. They were allowed to leave legally. So basically, my childhood and my young age were nothing else but living in under 
incredible circumstances, really incredible circumstances. I mean, I can't describe them. And then once more again, my smartness saved me because I had nothing else. So instead of becoming a prostitute or reproducing what my mother used to do, like becoming alcoholic, I did everything the opposite. <laughs> Because as a child, my logic was, if I do the opposite, what I was witnessing, maybe I could be okay. I just didn't know when. I can discern today the people that are aware of their own difficulties compared to those who aren't aware, even if it seems too simplistic. No, I understand it. Yeah, I understand your reflection on that. Yeah, I also recognize it right away. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks to perhaps modern, or whatever that means, in certain regions of the world with certain comforts, it seems that people are not used to difficulties and used to outsiders. And I love this quote that you wrote, ambivalence has no limits. I've never seen a more destructive form of relating in everyday life. The peaceful and harmonious solutions of conflicts on which myths exported from Japan in the 80s were built was nothing else but a suppression of conflict, leaving them unsolved. And having lived in Japan and now in living in Germany, can you describe some of the similar oppressions of modern world or ambivalence to pain in other people? First of all, you know, whenever I hear this cultural difference as an expression, thanks to the Japanese extreme nationalistic usage of culture, bunka. Bunka or wenhua in Mandarin, translate directly to the English word culture. I am reminded often of the comparisons of culture, as in German culture, Italian culture, Japanese culture, or worse yet, Asian culture. What is culture really, but myths constructed to fit a narrative or of a nation state? These terms can blend quickly to ideas of nature or naturalism, this is our culture. Do what is natural. Do what is in our natural culture, as we may hear in our lives. Because they use for everything, you know? I mean, literally they use for everything, which is reaffirming their uniqueness. So I rather prefer to use the expression socializing process because um, I don't know how you mean that in the modern world I feel the oppression, but one fact remains outstanding in my last, let's say, two and a half decades. I left Hungary 27 years ago, okay? That's a long time. And that is that creating or rather recreating my identity, my intellectual autonomy uh, are the two treasures I have. And uh, that's why, for example, when we had to stay in Berlin in 2011, March 11th, when Fukushima triple tragedy happened, and we decided with my husband not to return, Actually, I cut all my previous quite well-established academic background. I never ever rejoined because I learned in the 17 years in Japan that being a social scientist not necessarily links to being an autonomous human being. I never understood how people could deal with social issues as scientists without having moral and ethical principles toward a given society. And I always felt these contradicting elements that in the academic life, you know, they call it, I don't like this expression, rat race, uh, meat market, the job market, publish or perish, enviously, looking at the others in large international conferences, who talks to whom, having this all the time almost unfinished power game, 
within the academia, in the universities, wherever, I decided in 2011 that thank you, but no thank you, not more. I did everything, you know, which I was able, and I probably not exaggeration, I did reach the level in the Japanese <laughs> university world, which even thousands of Japanese never can dream of. Having, you know, this professorship at the most famous uh, private, oldest private university in Japan, blah, blah, blah. I can, although I missed badly, ah, oh, painfully the teaching, oh, how much I miss the teaching. It's much better for me not to belong anymore to this academic world and not to belong to any institutional network and not belonging to any place because it was just enough. Plus, I was lucky to experience not only in Japan, but uh, in several other countries in three different continents, how the entire higher educational system has become out of date how illusionary the whole thing, speaking less politely, how overwhelmingly we are cheating the students, how the entire academic life became really unbearable because of this all the time competing. And uh, I believe that I never want to adjust in the rest of my life anymore, mentally, intellectually, or even professionally, institutional expectations. Not because I'm unable. Yes, I am able. I tried. I did quite successfully. I was the number one professor at this private university in Japan, but because I don't want to. I don't want to do it anymore. I think uh, the the entire social scientific academic life and uh, the higher education relating to social science had been really very deep crisis in the last three decades. And very few universities wanted to reflect on that and just they call it reforming. But as we all know, reforming means that we keep the old and adding some new, and together we can continue. Of course, you can say a few exceptions, but uh, overall, I really don't want to adjust anymore. And the reason, finally, for doing so that I always been aware since my young age that I was literally the best in teaching because of my personality. Therefore, I knew that, uh, yes, I can do this academic writing. Yes, I can publish. Yes, I can do all of the things. But for me, the real intellectual activity was the teaching. And seemingly, you know, universities never never appreciate, you know, good teachers. It's something else, uh, you know, being loyal to the institute, to the university bureaucracy, management, money, income, money, blah, blah, blah. I do think that if someone has, like me, such a strong pedagogical uh, drive and very good one because in Hungary we used to have many, many very, very excellent in international scale pedagogical psychologists. And I learned most of my teaching methods from them. Therefore, I, I just didn't want to, to be an outstandingly good teacher. Meanwhile, all of my colleagues or 99% were hating me, you know, because all the students wanted to come to my class. I wasn't popular, just my courses were the highest quality. So, but it was very difficult course, each of them. The point is that I never wanted to compromise my 
principles, neither as a professional nor as a human being. And finally, I ended up with being absolutely no job, no extra income, no nothing. I mean, I do what I can, but uh, I don't need to adjust to institutional expectations. I don't want to do that anymore. I did it and I didn't like it. Of these expectations, would you say that it's also connected to what you've been describing and as a form of historical perspective that the creation and the myth of Japan and the institution of the idea of Japan is a construct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how much of that was when you were teaching and offering a perspective that was really deviating from that myth? That's an extremely important question. And I appreciate indeed for asking me about that because actually I was teaching a multiple layers Japan instead of being homogeneous, being even, being harmonious, being conflict avoiding. Instead, I was teaching Japan as any other countries I would have taught. Any other countries, I mean, with the contradictions, with the conflicts, with the problems. I do remember once the early 21st century that I always been teaching in large international programs altogether from 25 countries, students in one class. And I vividly remember two outstandingly stormy moments. One was when I did bring my class as a, a seminar on the invisible groups of the Japanese society. That was the course title, the invisible groups of the Japanese society. And I did bring them to the largest daily home, homeless care center. It was run by one of my friends who was a foreigner, <laughs> of course. <laughs> These students were sitting there, couldn't believe their eyes, not only Japanese, but many other countries, students. Suddenly, I recognized that uh, these students now witnessing themselves something which is true and not the enemy of Japan or not the Japan bashing as the literature describes and as most of the Japanese describes that uncomfortable elements of our society should be hidden and they never could talk about it in public. Now, the second moment was even more remarkable when I was teaching introduction into the contemporary everyday life of, in Japan. And one article was the reading, which was written actually by a Japanese anthropologist. Okay, but the article was also available in English. And this article, as an anthropological research and inquiry, summarized the outcast Burakumin. Burakumin directly translates to Hamlet or village people as a concept for the untouchable group in Japan at the bottom of the traditional social hierarchy during the feudal era. These included people such as executioners, undertakers, slaughterhouse workers, butchers or tanners. Burakumin became a hereditary status of the untouchability and unofficial caste in the Tokugawa class system. The Burakumin received severe discrimination and ostracism in the Japanese societies and lived as outcasts, separate villages or ghettos. Despite being abolished after the Meiji Restoration in 1868, the descendants of the Burakumen has continued to face stigmatization and discrimination in Japan. This makes me think of the United States or in Europe. The idea of the racialized communities, that the blacks, the Asians, the Latinx, that in Germany, the Turkish or the Arab community, as well as in Europe in general, the Roman people or the gypsies. And when I think of the recent anti-Asian hate crimes, I see the parallel with which the way that we see in a society that we wish to believe that we're living in a modern place, that we have done away with class and power, that such systems should be there at all. So much that when the violence emerges with evidence, 
we are shocked. When I see the violence that has been happening, I am not surprised or shocked. Rather, I find it important that as a society, we are ready to see such violence so that we can address it. As the class began, one student, a Japanese student, of course, almost in tears, stood up and he said that uh, these articles author must not be Japanese. And I said, I can write with the Japanese characters his name on the blackboard. And he said he hates Japan. Uh, these anthropologists, actually very famous anthropologists living in Japan, actually living in Tokyo. And, uh, you know, the whole class suddenly was really shocked and alarmed. And he went on. It cannot be true that we have these uh, hundreds of thousands of people who, since the 17th, early 17th century, uh, must live. Actually, finally, we ended up with the kind of humorous remark, which I made, that actually only three subways stopped and you can find this untouchable Budakumin district because they are in the same locations all over Japan since the early 17th century. Budakumin, uh, which is a euphemistic name for the untouchable, the non-pure people. So these two extreme, of course I know I'm aware, examples, just uh, describe the homogeneous, peaceful, conflict avoiding, no problem Japanese society image is basically nothing else but a permanent self defense. Because you don't need to stress all the time that we avoid the conflicts if you don't have conflicts. You don't need to stress the peacefulness unless you have lack of peace. <laughs> but I've been teaching the Japanese empire history, for example, social, economical, and financial history of the Japanese empire. Now, this is unheard in the Japanese higher education. I was the only one. And of course, the question comes immediately to anyone's mind, okay, how come that what I was teaching was not penalized or not censored. Now, first of all, you know, there are thousands of sophisticated ways, for example, to ignore things which are in front of someone's eyes. And the second one, of course, uh, classes cannot be checked by anyone. But on the other hand, the teacher can be treated as a too outstanding, too strained person. And as the Japanese proverb says, the outstanding nail should be pushed back. More precisely from Japanese, should be hit. So honestly, I didn't care because not to know is far more dangerous than to know. And the students had to be equipped with the understanding where they live, if they were Japanese, or what they are dealing with later as either a banker, a businessman or businesswoman, or even a scholar. How can I lie? How can I hide? Would you say that if you have emigrated to Japan at an earlier age, would you have experienced or behaved differently in terms of being able to navigate the dominance and subordination structures that is there? No, no, it would have been much worse because I had friends over there, foreigners, who went to Japan much earlier than I did, and uh, including women, and in East Asia, it does matter. <laughs> it does matter. And uh, no, it was much worse. It was much worse. I was even glad that after working for two years in deep countryside university, there my salary was the lowest one. Meanwhile, my academic achievement was the second highest one among the colleagues. 
And when I asked why my salary is the lowest, my the educational board uh, head said bluntly that number one, you are foreigner, number two, you are only a woman. But when I went to this famous private university in Tokyo, there was no difference between male and female income. And there was no such a kind of, without exaggerating, discriminatory thing. But nevertheless, my concept always been why I was working there, that I'm a guest worker. I'm a guest worker. And uh, if I'm a guest worker, I must do at least twice more and twice better than the locals, because this is the guest worker duty. And despite my achievement, they can get rid of me anytime. I mean, because I'm a guest worker. They can use me until they want. If they don't want to use me, they decide and I'm not there anymore. Not necessarily because this was the case, nobody kicked me out, but I never expected acceptance in the Japanese society because in a society where people have difficulties in everyday life, in everyday interactions to accept each other, how we can expect to be accepted as foreigners? Now, instead of crying and self-pitying about the discriminatory conducts and uh, these kind of things in Japan, I wanted to find the advantage of this position as a foreigner. And I found it. And that was that they never can touch my autonomy. They never can touch my intellectual independence. Therefore, because I didn't want to be integrated into the Japanese society, I wanted to be functioning, and that's it. I mean, learning the language, learning the customs, learning the everyday life, learning the best possible way, everything which they live in, but not more. Why I should bow? Am I Japanese? No, I'm not. Everybody can see it. So I had student, Ayoto, believe me or not, who after their arrival two days later, they did buy uh, brown contact lenses. Some students of mine actually dyed her hair into black because they were so eager to be accepted. But for me, it was customary that I never been accepted by my own society. So <laughs> nothing changed. That was okay. Bit of a background. I grew up in Australia. And speaking of Australia, you know, in a way, we're somehow polar opposites. But actually, I feel very much understood by you. And the thing is that what you just spoke about, this idea of integration. And for example, when you get an Australian citizenship, there's an integration test, all of these things to make sure that you integrate. And there's a great pressure for people to integrate the violence that it's very interesting for me to hear from you to have also the same kind of frustration. What do you think about the situation here? For example, that I'm an Asian person in Germany, then all the people will say, well, you should integrate. You should learn the way to do it the way that people do it here, a kind of when in Rome. But here you're saying very proudly and with your own approach in your own way of surviving the total opposite of that how do you feel about the idea that people ought to integrate to a society yeah i heard for the first three years all the time from various japanese people do as the people do in rome and uh, many many years later when only one person tried to address to me this in japan my answer was that, can you tell me one Japanese who ever adjusting to any foreign customs when you are abroad? Because I can list the opposite. 
how you go only to Japanese restaurants, how you being in contact only with Japanese, how you use all the time your language, how you believe that whole globe must function as Japan does. Where is the reciprocity there? You know, when we are expected to adjust or at least openness expected by me. And I heard this in Berlin too, from the very first week. I remember vividly that somebody addressed to me this, that you better darling to learn the German way because otherwise you will have a lot of troubles. That's what this gentleman said to me. I was smiling and I said, yeah, it's familiar to me. I was told thousands of times similar things in Japan. My background is profoundly differs from yours. And I said, try me. I never want to learn once more because it's a lie. You learn this and you will be spit out exactly the same way as you didn't learn. So, you know, this whole forcing and reinforcing are suspicious to me. And I learned it in Japan. Let me tell you just the simplest example, the language. I learned Japanese and nobody forced me to learn Japanese. As you probably know, the Japanese language is extremely difficult. And as a European, although I had some foreign languages, you know, knowledge and comprehension before I went to Japan, because I was coming from a linguistic family, actually. My aunt used to speak 12 languages. And they kept telling me in Japan, oh, you're never going to learn this language. Oh, you are too old. Oh, it's impossible for you. You must be born in Japan to speak Japanese. And I was listening this and I was sick of it. Then I learned Japanese, spending my saved money, enormous amount of money for the best possible language schools. Then I was really fluent in Japanese. I mean... Really, even my own Japanese husband sometimes whispered that, oh my goodness, how beautiful Japanese you speak. It was even more uncomfortable, Ayoto, for me. As a joke, I told my husband several times, oh, this golden period, the first couple of years, then I couldn't understand a single word in Japanese. And he asked me why. I said, because I was able to use my imagination, my fantasy, and I never had to understand what they were talking about. And of course it was, you know, a joke and it was a kind of exaggerated reality. But the reality was that none of my environment surrounding Japanese people changed with me just because my Japanese was good because it's not a question of having language fluency. It's the social interaction. It's the similar in Berlin. I always get this lecturing, yelling at me, being aggressive, looking down on me because my German is far from good. I just ask very quietly and peacefully, sir or madam, how many languages you speak? Now just, just tell me. Okay, I'm the same human being. But as we all know, language is a kind of scapegoat. So because I don't speak the language, of course, I'm an idiot. I mean, hello. <laughs> so, you know, being integrated, I never had any interest in it. Uh, since I'd been living in Japan and East Asia, because you have probably I must add to that, that I was working as an international program head, one of the heads, and I had to travel a lot, including to Australia, Australian universities, New Zealand, South Korea, China. Uh, I had many, many, many Chinese students from various Chinese universities 
and interesting or not. Of course, I didn't live in China, but I never had this very uncomfortable feeling, you know, in China as a foreigner. Maybe I should have if I stayed longer than in Japan from the very first day till the last day when I left. So, you know, I don't want to be integrated. I mean, I don't want to. I mean, what's the meaning? I mean, I think the Berliners who surrounding us having far deeper problems than my crappy German and the fact that my husband is Japanese and I'm uh, European. We get remarks recently since the COVID broken out on the street in Uban, Esban, but exclusion is a universal principle and it is generated by fears. I am deeply, deeply believing that the fears uh, from unknown, unusual, generating either racist or discriminatory or any other excluding reflection and reaction on people. And one more thing, you know, when I was married in Japan after several years, I had first a permanent job. I had the permanent residential permission in Japan, which comes right after the citizenship, okay, as legal category. I was asked whether I wanted to apply for Japanese citizenship. And my answer was never. And they asked back, why? My answer was that, first of all, all of my teaching and writing, doing nothing else but critically viewing the entire Japanese history and system. Why should I seek an acceptance from a government which I all the time criticize? And the second one, look at my face. Am I looking as a Japanese? Of course not. So why should I do that? And that was it. I never applied Japanese or any other citizenship on the globe. Never. What's it like being a European woman married to a Japanese man? Being together for seven years and only after I got all of my independent legal stable status in Japan, then we were married. Okay, then, after then. Uh, and that was my decision. I wanted to be in Japan by my own rights instead of a marriage certificate, which thousands doing. It was difficult. Difficult because uh, both of us had to recognize that uh, there are differences which we cannot bridge. There is no bridge. And it was difficult because for years since we've been together, both environment, my foreign environment over there or surrounding and my husband's family completely neglected us. My foreign environment, because they believed that I was an absolutely mad person to marry to a Japanese or living with a Japanese or being with a Japanese. And the Japanese family of my husband believed until we'd been together, but not living together and not married, that practically I was just a temporary concubine. And then when it turned out that none of them being true, the Japanese family, my husband's Japanese relatives, brothers, sisters, gradually accepted me and gradually used me as the Japanese tradition dictates. Because my husband is a firstborn son, so the firstborn son, wife, uh, has the highest duties toward the husband's family, taking care of the elderly. I did everything. I think I did far better than any other Japanese counterpart mm -hmm. could have done. Mm -hmm. But it was difficult. First of all, the hardship for me was the emotional deficiency. I cannot express in any other way 
I'm coming from a very passionate, very expressive social background, which is the Hungarian society. Yeah, sure, it's gloomy, but everybody has the gestures, everybody has the smiles, everybody has very strong emotional expression and expressing ways. The most difficult for me was the lack of gestures, the lack of hugging, the lack of innocent expressions of love and acceptance. I'm talking about inside of the family. And uh, that was heavy. That was really heavy. And it didn't matter for me that all of my larger surrounding behaved similarly because I was a complete adult when I went to Japan. So I wasn't young, like 10 years old kid or 25 years old beginner. So yeah, I did hide my gestures. I tried to restrict my emotional expressions and views. But when I returned, so to speak, to Europe, everything came back as, as I always been. The most difficult thing was to accept never expressing in public either positive or negative emotions, because by and large, it's a signal of weakness or lack of self-control. And that was very heavy on me for 17 years, really very heavy. But I had purpose and I learned what I wanted and that was the price. What was the driving force behind your interests with regards to the history and the construct of the economics of Japan? Um, can you rephrase your question? For example, I can see very much the enthusiasm but it's not a fetishization over the concept, no, 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 which is extremely no. common and quite no. ugly. No, yeah. <laughs> and yet for you, there is still a huge enthusiasm and passion for researching and understanding the subject yeah. without the fetishization. Yeah. What is that difference? Um, because I grew up only by one thing, that knowledge brings understanding. Understanding maybe brings a little bit easier life for me because I had nothing else. When someone grew up, you know, without family, without any support or relatives, without any help from anyone, the only thing which may help is performance, knowledge-related output. That was always since I was six years old. Of course, it was very painful and discouraging to recognize that not only knowledge matters. <laughs> because my look, you know, was very poverty related. Everybody immediately could see it. My behavior was absolutely extreme, but my mind was extremely sharp as a kid. So somehow I did believe in one and only one thing, and that was knowledge. And that drove me in Japan too. You know, I, I didn't come, Mayoto, from a comfortable environment. I didn't come with a silver spoon in my mouth. Hardship, difficulties were normal. Therefore, as I used to joke, not anymore, I always been excellent to solve crises and very heavy difficulties. And I was almost like an idiot when normal situation came because I didn't know what normal situation requires from me. But I knew immediately what requires when difficulties I have. And I was struggling and struggling and... Uh, I didn't want to prove to the Japanese people. I wanted to prove to myself that I can do it. And I did it. And there was another motivation which I should not forget to mention. Because of my background in the Hungarian society, I always been thinking in long term. Because, you know, when someone grows up without basics, without having too much joy. The only thing which 
helped me to keep my hope and we may call it motivation with passion was that I don't care how difficult my life is today. I don't care that I don't have apartment. I don't have car. Actually, I don't have car e even now. I don't have this and that. I do care one thing where I will be 20 years later, what I'm going to do 20 years later, that matters to me because I wanted to envision, imagine that my goals can be achieved and I will be in a place where my work is completely satisfying and I'm doing what I really love, not like what my really love. Therefore, that was my purpose to be absolutely satisfied, not by items. I don't want to be Hippocratic, I would hope, please don't mistake me. Of course, I always made money which I needed by myself. And then I had finally, after 50 years old age of mine, a comfortable income. Of course, I enjoyed it. But the goal was not item. The goal was that I wanted to do something which really made me satisfied and being in good relationship with myself. And I did it. And that's what I did in Japan too. From the beginning, I arrived as a visiting professor and I ended up in the most famous private university. I was hired from 2,200 applicants. I was teaching in a way which I always wanted. I had international army of students from all over the world what else I wanted. I mean, that was, that was the best I could have. Car, hey, item, hey. I mean, that's gone. But this intellectual acumen, this intellectual joy is not easy to reach. And I did reach it. That was my motivation, so to speak. This is part one of two of my conversation with Dr. Kotalin Ferber. We'll be back with the second half of our conversation next week. In the meantime, you can find a book, Islands of Otherness, on Amazon Kindle. Dr. Kotalin Ferber is an economic historian and holds a PhD in economic history from the Budapest University of Economics. You can read a book, Islands of Otherness, available on Amazon Kindle. Special thanks to Yatsin Halas for this introduction. Asian Provocation is a queer conversational podcast sharing invisible ideas and stories with a focus on Asian diaspora. Learn more about the stories as well as other information on cinema, books, and ideas on our website, www.asianprovocation.com. Asian Provocation is produced by yours truly, Ayoto Ataraxia. Music on this episode are by August Wilhelmson and Silver Maple. Special thanks to Liv Phoenix, Adam Ridgeway, and Rafa Cobiela. You can find the show notes on the website, asianprovocation.com. This is an independent, listener-supported podcast. You can donate a one-time support directly on the website or monthly support on patreon.com. You can also tweet us at appod or connect on Instagram at asianprovocation. Welcome back to Asian Provocation. This is part two of two with Dr. Kotalin Ferber. Please return to the previous episode prior to this if you haven't heard the first part. And now, back to the conversation. You have spoken about the cohesiveness of Japan, especially during this period of its colonization of Southeast Asia. And with this observation, what is keeping the cohesiveness of Europe? And will there be continued cohesiveness for the future of Europe? Undoubtedly, there are fundamentals which we understand under the label Europe. 
And uh, the original, okay, the original idea of creating EU was how the differences could create cohesiveness. So just the opposite of the Japanese social pattern, how the rejection of differences could create social cohesion in the Japanese society. The European idea seemingly was the opposite, how the differences could make stronger integrated Europe, if it makes sense what I'm saying. Absolutely, but but I can't help but get this feeling that it's moving actually towards a similar kind of desire for conflict avoidance and also the inability to accept difference. Yeah, but I have not finished yet. That was the original idea. And in reality, it has become the opposite. Because instead of based on European values, because that is the shortest way to put it, it based hegemonic values, uh, namely the strongest country's values. And because it was switched from the European common values to the hegemonic economic and financial powers values, which was labeled as European principles. And it was almost unavoidable that led to the poorer and poorest regions, let's call it semi-peripheric and peripheric countries, disintegrating reaction. And therefore, the hegemonic economic and financial ideas and politics and practice actually behaves now as a blowback because the semi-peripheric and the peripheric countries, semi-peripheric, for example, Spain or Greece, and peripheric countries, the entire Eastern Europe, including Hungary, of course, their reaction being unavoidable and became a blowback, disintegrating the entire EU. Therefore, the exclusion became the value and the inclusion became the sin. Of course, the rhetoric is the op opposite. Of course, of course, we know that. But the, in Japan also, harmony, peaceful, conflict avoiding. Yeah, the rhetoric always the opposite, of course. But the real cohesion does not because cannot exist anymore in Europe based on integration and cohesiveness. No. And that that is not because of the COVID, okay? I'm talking about that before the COVID. The symptoms, the signals came almost endlessly. Yeah, there's been a lot of incidences and situations that's been happening since COVID, and many people are shocked and surprised, but I get the sense that these aren't out of the ordinary. It was there anyway. It's just now exploding and people are finally noticing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I, I fully agree with you. You have described yourself as a perpetual emigre for your remaining years. Could you explain what the difference is between an emigre and an immigrant? Mm -hmm. And why do you express yourself as such? You know, I, I have only few favorite authors in social science, very few, maybe four or five. One of my really close or in the middle of my heart is Polanyi, who wrote a book, uh, The Great Transformation in 1944. Of course, he was Hungarian, Austrian background, and he had to emigrate to the United States of America, and he wrote there this excellent book, which is which is fundamental, like a Bible for social scientists, the great transformation. Now, Polanyi writes in his book, which I read several times, and time to time I return to his book, that, you know, it's lovely to have this capitalist profit-seeking illusion of the world economy, but very few people want to acknowledge that free move of uh, money and the free move of companies and free move of that and that never ever link to completely free movement of human beings. And therefore, my own view on being an immigrant 
is simply coming from the fact that since I'm not willing to in, to be integrated by any country, by any system, therefore, I never expect anything else from the hosting country currently in Berlin than just uh, reluctantly but acknowledging that I'm also here. They allow me to be here and I do not want to expect more. I never taken a single penny from the German or any other government. Actually, they can get a lot of money from me because consumption and or rent payment and we we are not uh, taxpayers here because you know or pension coming from two different countries than germany so therefore you know we have nothing to do with income making and taxation here and it's absolutely legal and uh, normal but the point is that we don't have only in bureaucratic sense european citizens We have passport, which we can, in theory, freely travel when we don't have COVID, the Schengen zone countries. And I have that passport too as a Hungarian, but indeed, I'm not a European citizen. Not because I don't want to, but because I'm not allowed to. One example, my own country, Hungary, in the last decade has become one of the most authoritarian clearly articulated, not neo, but anti-Semitist, racist, extreme right-wing regime. Now, as coming from intellectual and half-Jewish background, and having the knowledge I have, I would have liked to ask a political uh, refugee status in any European country. I cannot, because EU citizen never can have refugee status in any EU country. So I'm just here physically. I don't think mentally I'm here or emotionally I'm here, but that is even good because I don't need to have any emotions toward what I'm witnessing here every day. Thank you very much. No, 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 no. I have my Japanese background to see what is not going on here. Therefore, people like me, because I don't think I'm alone, we have similar people who are thinking along the similar way. For me and for these similar mentality people, our home is inside of us. So physically, I'm in Germany as EU citizen because I'm allowed to be here because I have my income independently from the German system and the German market. Therefore, I think that's it. That's it. I mean, nothing else. The home is inside of me. So no matter where I live, I'm not seeking the home outside. That's a type of view on being immigrant. Your sentiments really resonate with me. It's something that I relate to very much. The idea of a post-nation state, especially in our times where we're witnessing an acceleration and return towards nationalism. Yes, yes, exactly. That's what I was mentioning in this book. And what are your observations of the experiences of your husband or other Asians that you see in Europe during this period? Just one fact that in 2011, March 11, just the 10 years anniversary of the Fukushima triple disaster, hundreds of thousands of Japanese never returned to Japan at that time who were at that time abroad because March is usually the academic and the school holiday, one month, the whole March. Therefore, a lot of people, especially with children, were abroad, not only foreigners who stayed like me and worked permanently in Japan, but Japanese citizens too. Many, many Japanese never returned since then. So the first couple of years for us, were relatively and surprisingly peaceful. It had two elements. One was that the bureaucracy was very, very, very fluent with a non-EU citizen 
Japanese, my husband. So he was talking my husband for a year almost to his Japanese acquaintances and friends that he got the five years visa. He got it after eight minutes and for eight euro. And he couldn't believe it, how easy it was. Of course, we had the income, you know, we had everything. I mean, they just, and, and we were married legally, so, and I'm an EU citizen, so the bureaucracy didn't do anything else, just following the law. But remembering of Japan where I had to apply every single year a visa for the, for the next year, and I did it for altogether nine years, that was awful. And plus, I had to apply re-entry visa every time I traveled abroad. Now, this experience was completely the opposite, positively opposite. On the other hand, after a couple of years, we started to discover some hidden, not so apparent distinctions. And I cannot say because it would be not exaggeration, but lie, that my husband had similar experience like I had in Japan. No, he never had. Other than since the COVID came. In the last year, since last February, we started experiencing first time, first time here, very, very nasty remarks on the street, about me and about him because we were together. We, he was labeled several times loud as Chinese who did bring the COVID. He was even experiencing that somebody was spitting in front of him. Then the COVID was last April, really fearful first experience for everyone. People literally got off from Uban and Esban and went to the other car because we were there. So, you know, once more, it was far uh, less painful than my experience in Japan, where people both sides on the subway stood up because, quote, we're not going to catch some bugs from a foreigner. So it was far less difficult, far less uh, painful. And my husband profoundly enjoys almost for a decade, you know, other than the COVID, of course, before COVID time, everything which he never could have had in the Japanese everyday life, the theaters, the the concerts, the exhibitions, the marvelous uh, parks, and uh, he loves all of this. He loves all of this. And it's available for both of us, which was out of question in the Japanese everyday life. Because number one, it's so expensive. Number two, other difficulties. So uh, no, the two experience cannot be comparable. He had, other than before the COVID, he never had any kind of uh, kind of uh, uncomfortable discriminatory related experience here in Berlin. That's why he loved being here and that's why he insisted on staying here. Uh, I never wanted to stay here, but uh, because he's much elder than me, I followed his wish. It's natural to me. No, the two experiences cannot be comparable. It was far more difficult to be a foreigner 10 years ago in Japan than being uh, even as a different look foreigner in Berlin. Far more difficult. It was far more. In a book, Islands of Otherness, the topic of Ijime is discussed. The closest translation of the word could be bullying, even though that's very misleading. Ijime is an open, invisible secret in Japan, a phenomenon that happens not only within the educational system, but a societal phenomenon. It presents itself throughout one's life. The essence of Ijime is that a randomly chosen child is ridiculed, tortured, and blackmailed by their own classmates. Teachers never intervene even if they know about it, and without exception, claim that they know nothing. 
They do this despite the fact that most children who commit suicide leave a farewell note in which they mention that they cannot cope with being tortured, physically abused, or financially blackmailed. Japan is the number one in the world as far as child suicide is concerned, and most of the victims are actually victims of Ijime. Children choose to end their lives in their despair because they have nobody to turn to for help. Other countries, Hungary, Britain, or the US, also have such cases. The difference is not purely a statistical one. In Japan, the reason is societal. Ijime starts at the school, but is not unknown among adults either. Quite the contrary, it is there in companies, the universities, among other colleagues and fellow students. The choice of victim is coincidental and unclear in the childhood and adult alike. Often it is teachers and groups of opinion leaders students together choose the next target for Ijime. This and only this indicates that Ijime is not only an issue of education, but of Japanese society. In order to preserve discipline in the classroom, the teacher often chooses a student in the class who can become a target of humiliation and torture. And whoever does not join the others in committing it can quickly become the next target. In this way, the teacher can keep order in the classroom more easily. Or, to put it simply, the teacher can transfer their frustrations to the students. You can see an example of this discussed in two Japanese films. One is by Tatsuya Nakashima, which is based on a novel by Kenai Minato, a bestseller from 2008. This film is about a high school teacher who turns into a cruel killer for revenge for the death of her daughter. The movie reveals much of the societal problems in Japan. Another very well-known example is Takeshi Kitano's cult classic, Battle Royale, where annually a graduating class is chosen at random, sent to an island and forced to kill one another. As to set an example for the rest of the nation, the value of life and to respect order and peace. I asked Kate, is the Jimei quite invisible to its own people? And is there anything quite comparable in other societies that she has lived in? I'm trying to answer first from the opposite direction that when we questioning, you know, these, uh, I think, soon dying out or try to be revived by the current right wing government, the other administration right now, again, this Japanese uniqueness, you know, that we don't have any problem with the ugly Western or outside dangerous world has and experiencing. Since Fukushima, I think much less people in Japan ever believe in it than before, because Fukushima did prove that Japan had very deep troubles. Behind these economic success, and now we arrived at the point when we can compare the Japanese large companies lying, disinforming, misleading, uh, lack of accountability, lack of transparency, even uglier than many other countries, large companies, the multinationals, they love saying that. I don't like this expression. Yes, from my first couple of years experience, once I said that if someone doesn't learn in Japan, that Japan is exactly the same country like any other country on the world, of course, with the historical difference, of course, with the cultural and the social patterns, but let's view it as I'm in a country where Good things, bad things, problems, tragedies, catastrophes, or any other contradicting elements can be found just like beautiful elements. And when someone has this view on Japan, we can compare. But having this without questioning, having this face value that Japan is unique, Japan never had these problems like the other multi-ethnic countries, because I remember one prime minister of Japan said that even in international press conference, oh, the United States of America has so many problems because they accept different ethnicities. Oh my goodness. And look at Japan. We don't have any problem because we are homogeneous ethnicity, only Japanese. Thank you very much. I think Japan is just like any other country, but understanding East Asia helps a lot understanding Japan. Not knowing 
anything about East Asia completely could be misleading about Japan. I do think that Japan in many ways comparable, but with one distinction, this Ijime, the Japanese government for years, more than almost two decades, kept repeating for the public and for the outside world that, oh, everywhere has bullying and, oh, it doesn't matter. And in this sense, this is not an explanation because, you know, having a problem doesn't mean that other countries have more problems, so we don't need to deal with this problem. So relativizing the problem instead of seeking solution is wrong. But understanding the background of the problem and what causing it helps to solve the problem. But, you know, Irima is the thing which cannot be solved because it's a social pattern. So it's not a school problem. Ijime exists everywhere, in working place too. Do you think this is something that society can discuss and perhaps evolve from? Since i never been to Japan in the last decade, I'm extremely cautious, maybe over-cautious, to answer to this. A lot to be said that a lot of things drastically, which I don't believe because while I was there, nothing ever changed drastically in Japan. It's just not understandable for most of the Japanese society members that drastic change. I do think that even sounds a bit ridiculous, but unless the Japanese hierarchical language usage, like one language for female, one language for males, one language for upper class or subordinate, the other language, and one language which everybody must learn and understand, but nobody can use because that is the emperor family language. Korean language is similar. Arab language is similar. But unless they eliminate the language usage as a self-censorship, because female must select a language to talk to the other female if the other female is elder, if the other female husband is higher than my husband, etc., etc. It's very complicated and must use properly these several language. It's not dialect, it's different language. So unless they eliminate these language differences as a compulsory, mandatory usage in everyday social interactions, other than in kindergarten and other than same age, same point as university students, but it's soon over because they must work. And in working place, again, the hierarchical language usage is mandatory. Unless these language differences are eliminated, in this case, Distinction, discrimination, exclusion, always been there. Always will be there. Always. Always. Because the language is always us. Then we must select a language to talk to the other. Immediately selecting the language for me means, I I practiced it of course, that we put ourselves in to a certain social category. So how we can treat each other as equal? It's impossible. So therefore, I do think that uh, exclusion and making the given group stronger cohesion or giving to an individual temporary feeling of dominating the situation or being powerful we we'll stay there, always we we'll stay there. For me, the most embarrassing, disturbing, and finally, after more than 15 years, frustrating element of the everyday life in Japan was that I never been able to maintain a discussion with any other Japanese except from my husband without being dominated or 
dominate the other. And it's so frustrating, you know? It's just so frustrating because I never seen a kind of balanced uh, discussion. And of course, I'm not blaming anyone for this, but it's very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable. So always uh, power and domination are in every conversation, even in the banal conversations. And I do think finally that uh, group cohesiveness and the group awareness are dominating most of the East Asian societies, if not all. But my deepest experience only in Japan exists, so I cannot refer to other societies. Therefore, following the group waves and uh, hidden or explicit expectations as behavior, as opinion, as view, making most of the people in their socializing process from childhood extremely selfish because they must oppress their selves. Therefore, two persons conversation, always seeking, you know, this, I will dominate or, or I will be dominated. Competitiveness is everywhere in the Japanese uh, everyday life, everywhere. But of course it's hidden, it's hidden. Because everybody learned from childhood how to pretend the opposite, the group cohesion, the peacefulness, the conflict avoidance, and never expressing their own inner feelings or opinions. It's a heavy society. You have many discussions and lectures about the idea of latecomers, particularly referring to the Southeast Asian economies. Can you speak about this current moment in history, particularly the contrast between China and Japan and the way they have structured their economy? Now, you know, the East Asians, because I don't have other than minimal common sense knowledge, the Southeast Asian countries, I know a little bit more about Vietnam, but uh, not too much about Indonesia, Malaysia maybe, but I don't feel comfortable. What I do know is the East Asian core countries, Taiwan, mainland China, Singapore, South Korea, and Japan. Japan. And it's very clear to me in the last decade that what Japan permanent fear had been in the last 300 <laughs> years, unfortunately, it has become a reality. The Chinese takeover, the leadership economically and financially undoubtedly to me, is in Chinese hands. Not only within East Asia, but uh, in front of the Western developed world. And China already replaced in two positions. And one is the economic output, and the other one is the financial results, like the largest central bank assets, the largest capital exporting. Now Japan slipping down only to the third place. And I do believe that uh, China, in a few years, taking over from the first world economic leadership, from the United States of America. I'm absolutely sure that the 21st century second part or second half will be the East Asian century. I'm absolutely sure about that. It's also an interesting question that how we can compare Japan and China as these economic and financial success. I do think that most of the East Asian countries massively adopted the Japanese latecomer technique, policy making, company creating and company strategy. And most of them coming from the Japanese leading example, because Japan was the first westernized economy in East Asia. Now, China also learned enormously. But what for me, the most interesting point that China learned from the Japanese mistakes. 
What Japan was unable to do, China could do partially because of the geographic advantage comparing to Japan. Japan is a very tiny, small country, very, very small arable land. China is enormously big and I never can look at China even now as a country. I look at China as an empire. <laughs> with the multi-ethnical population and many other elements, which seemingly controlled by the center and from the center, but it's not true. It's not true. We have quite significant knowledge on the regional powers of the Chinese economy and financial accumulation. So in some, you know, China and maybe some people not only can argue easily with me, but uh, could be very, very angry at me because of my opinion. China is more successful other than the geographical, you know, and the size of the country because China even didn't allow up till now any kind of uh, local democratic existence. Japan has a lot of local East Asian type of democratically functioning groups and social layouts and organizations. China doesn't have, I think, any, because China is combining with uh, the one-party system with East Asia market strategy. And that's why it, it, it's so successful. And one more thing, I mean, it's not coincidence that despite of the common opinion, Western opinion, all of the East Asian latecomers Japan, then after the Second World War, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea, had practically one party system and uh, the economic and financial strategy to catching up and getting even with the Western dominating economic and financial powers were made thanks to the lack of Western type of democracy. I know it's terrible what I'm saying for people who love the Western type of democracy. But for me, it's almost one package because they never been for the kids a Western type of democracy, they were able to catch up and getting even and dominating now the world economy. I think that's something very difficult for people to face. Yeah, do you know why? Because of the inherent never plausible and never spoken out racism and prejudices. We have so many prejudices in the Western world, which we are unaware. We're just carrying. I mean, oh, oh, the Chinese, oh, come on. I mean, oh, what they are able to do. Excuse me? <laughs> I mean, excuse me? Usually when I hear or read, less hear than read, these kind of opinions from various, you know, sources, I'm a little bit bitterly smiling because I understand that as Polanyi wrote, you know, the great transformation, it's extremely painful to first acknowledge and then to admit, sadly, that we are not the best. And we are not the origin of all the goodies. Um, and th th there are many elements. One, um, me, I attach just in brackets. You know, I, I even when first I was the first six months in Berlin at Freie Universität, uh, uh, guest lecturer or guest whatever, spending my sabbatical six months here. And I offered the course, the early globalization and the interaction between East Asia and Europe from the 17th century. And we learned that students loved really the topic and the course. The students had to recognize and bitterly facing to the fact that what 
the earliest colonizing European powers literally legally stolen from East Asia, including China, including ideas, practice, strategy, policy making, so to speak, items like tea and the porcelain, very important. Then they adopted as their own in Europe and they started to present to their own society as they discovered these kind of things. No, they didn't. They did bring all of them from East Asia, mainly from China. So my uh, view tend to, you know, uh, understanding things first in East Asia and then analyzing things in Europe and not the other way around, because East Asia never could be responsive to experience how the European or Western, so to speak, ideology enforced and reinforced on understanding East Asian institute strategy and policy making. That's how I see it. They must be understood from their own value system. Do you think that this inability to recognize these prejudices within these invisible structures as the change of power that is happening and accelerating Mm -hmm. will become more evident? Or would there be more cognitive dissonance? In your opinion, how will the Europeans and the United States deal with this change of power? Badly. Very badly and poorly. But every transition had been similar, Ayotou. Every transition, we tend to forget that when England, as the British Empire, the world dominating power, politically, economically, and militarily, uh, had to give up this world dominating role to the United States of America, it was very difficult to accept uh, they created this commonwealth thing, you know, and they tend to forgive to their former colonies, especially India, what they did against India in India. But it was very painful and very difficult process to admit that the United Kingdom, not anymore the British Empire, in any sense. Now, the United States of America seemingly tries to struggle with this slipping away from the world economic, military, and financial power position. But there are thousands of signals and facts in the last two decades that this transition is going on without interruption. Sadly, how the United States tried to avoid this or fighting against it is overwhelmingly military way to fight against it, namely the military colonies, military stations all over the world. They have more than 900, but it doesn't work. East Asia is coming and already came, and uh, in many sense, the Western world should understand sooner or later that it's a different policy setting and China never wants to rule the globe and China never wants to colonize Europe and uh, the Chinese goals and targets and uh, purposes are profoundly differ from what we got to use to from the Western dominating hegemonic powers. But it's going to be very painful. Uh, Some country like Germany tries to, so to speak, soften this drastic change and running to have all the possible agreements with China and uh, tries to um, be accommodating with this East Asian economic and financial dominancy. But is going on and nobody can stop it. So I remember when I was still in Japan, I 
notice a very significant change. Meanwhile, I was there. Usually we were as university faculties interacting all over the globe, especially Western leading universities, students who were eagerly studying Japanese and uh, having the Japanese studies, so to speak, field. And then the early 2000 years, I suddenly noticed that less and less students enrolled in Western leading universities in Japanese field, but everybody started learning Chinese. So, I mean, that was for me the first signal that something gradually will change. So, as someone that has studied very deeply the economic history, do you observe the patterns and cyclical nature of history? Or would you say that we're the cusp of a new age and potential of breakthrough? And with your new book release, Life Dream, is that an attempt for you to share your story as a foreshadowing lesson with your understanding of the cyclical nature of history? Now, first, what I see is a very deep and almost uh, systemic contradiction relating to your question. One side is the enormous, almost rush of technological development, uh, which is even we cannot call anymore industrial or technological revolution because it's far more than that. When I think, you know, even it's failed a couple of times, Elon Musk attempt to occupy the moon and occupy this and that and in the space. And, and when I'm thinking the blockchain type of technology where we experience in everyday life almost because we cannot register even now in several internet sites, only by automatic, you know, it's, it's, it's just a software. I mean, no human needed anymore. So one side is hyper, super technological, rapid development. And on the other side, thanks partly because of, uh, to the pandemic, societies are falling apart. They cannot turn back the clock as it was before the pandemic. It's profoundly changing every single society, I do believe. It's profoundly questioning and changing later, even the social interactions. It, it will change systemically and systematically the structures of a given society, I think. Maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I see it. On the other hand, I don't see that uh, the world can overcome easily of these deepened financial, economic, social crisis due to the pandemic and much more, which started before the pandemic. And actually the pandemic was an unwanted outcome of several critical things which happened on the globe. What's gonna be, you know, the way out from it? No, I have no idea. I, I really have no idea because so many things should be changed from environmental to social structure that I can hardly imagine that is going to happen in my lifetime. On the other hand, as far as my book, which coming out actually first in Hungarian in March, now my, my life dream title book is basically from a kid's perspective, a kind of passionate monologue on Eastern European, let's say, last 70 years. Once more from child perspective, who cannot have the appropriate words to express what she witnessing, but as she grows up, she tries to understand that why individual's life, the historical changes 
basically cannot be connected only in negative way, more precisely, just like in East Asia in the last 150 years, what the state does with individuals, individuals not only cannot do anything against it, not only cannot protect themselves from it, but most of the cases, they cannot recognize it, what's happening to them. And that's the book. You speak about the apathy that comes with working so long in the educational system. From an institutional perspective, I can really relate to that. The frustration with a system that I must operate under. Mm -hmm. These structures of power Mm -hmm. that at the moment we all see to be wanting to move towards a freer and more independent mode of being. Yeah, I I fully agree with it. Do you see yourself working, expressing and sharing in a more direct, independent and autonomous way? Yes, yes, definitely. Yes, yes. For example, last year, one of the largest universities in Hungary asked me to give a lecture of course in Hungarian for me, it's not of course, because I can teach other languages too, but, uh, and uh, it was incredible how successful was it. Although, you know, my lecture on, because they ordered the topic, it's okay with me because it's such a unique occasion was for me, finally, I can teach even online. And uh, it was, it was going against the tide, you know, it was everything about the Japanese development and the latecomers development, which the students first heard from that perspective, and they loved it. So I do think that these crises, you know, the one of my few favorites again, Schumpeter, the Austrian origin economist who always said that the crisis, not always, but uh, many, many, many times also could create, not only destroy. So I do believe that not only you or me, but millions feeling something that that missing right now from our life, so we need to create. Dr. Kotalin Ferbe is an economic historian and holds a PhD in economic history from the Budapest University of Economics. You can read her book, Islands of Otherness, available on Amazon Kindle. Special thanks to Yatsin Halas for this introduction. Asian Provocation is a queer conversational podcast sharing invisible ideas and stories with a focus on Asian diaspora. Learn more about the stories as well as other information on cinema, books, and ideas on our website, www.asianprovocation.com. Asian Provocation is produced by yours truly, Ayoto Ataraxia. Music on this episode are by August Wilhelmsen and Silver Maple. Special thanks to Liv Phoenix, Adam Ridgeway, and Rafa Kobiela. You can find the show notes on the website, asianprovocation.com. This is an independent, listener-supported podcast. You can donate a one-time support directly on the website or monthly support on patreon.com. You can also tweet us at appod or connect on Instagram at Asian Provocation.